right, we get the uh, coveted post-lunch slot. Uh, hopefully keeping everybody uh, awake and away from the uh, post-lunch coma. But uh, I think we have a really interesting session. Uh, I'm Mike Masnick, I'm sort of part journalist, part think tanker, part game designer. I do a bunch of different things. Uh, but here I am going to be interviewing Anil Rao, who is uh, VP of Engineering in the office of the CTO at Intel. We're going to have a very interesting discussion, I think, about everything that's going on with confidential computing and confidential AI, which is actually a really, really interesting and very important, and I think not very well understood area um, so. that, that, that is important. So just to, to kick this off, um, can you describe for folks in the audience who might not know as much about it, like what is confidential computing as a, as a concept? Because I think that's an important sort of baseline. Yeah, um, Mike, that, that's uh, from, a, from a big picture perspective, like you said, it's not a very well understood area. Uh, really what happens in computing today is that most often when you have your data, and regardless of where the data is that you use in order to do computation, the data is encrypted when it's at rest, which means it's encrypted in storage. It's also encrypted while it's in transit, mm -hmm. which means it's encrypted while you're sending it through the networking infrastructure. However, it's not encrypted while it's in use. And what that means is that uh, let's say you adopt something in the public cloud, or let's say you adopt something in the edge in terms of infrastructure. These days, we absolutely want to move our data and process the data where it is most efficient to be processed. So while you're doing this and you're running something like a hypervisor or running in some sort of a third-party infrastructure, suddenly anyone who has access to that physical piece of infrastructure or even the virtual piece of infrastructure has access to your data in the clear. So uh, sometimes we talk about uh, how any type of communication that we do, even if you use WhatsApp and things like that, right? End to end it's encrypted, but think of uh, a bank. And in the bank, you are logging into your web URL and that's kind of like hosted in some sort of a server somewhere, whether it's private or public from a cloud perspective. Whoever is the administrator or anything of that particular infrastructure, they can just say, dump contents of the memory, and you can see everything. So what confidential computing does is it builds hardware level controls, hardware level restrictions, where your data is not visible to the underlying operating environment. Your data is not visible to the hypervisors. And you are in full control of your data, and you kind of like authorize and provide access to the data to who and which applications and software need access to that particular piece of data. And so can you, can you sort of explain a little bit deeper on that where, you know, whenever I hear talk about like confidential computing and how it all works, there's always talk of like, you know, enclaves and, and like basically, you know, moving the data away from the chip into this sort of, you know, special area uh, where it's protected and then things about attestation and, and all of that. Um, I think it's actually really useful background for, for, for this conversation. Can you just, you know, give the, the sort of, you know, 10,000 foot overview of how that aspect of confidential computing works? Absolutely. I'll talk to you in terms of uh, the underlying technology. So really what happens is that uh, if, you, if you look at um, traditional computing, uh, it, it doesn't matter what kind of computing. Data is typically stored in either hardware or somewhere on the network, and you bring the data into uh, the CPU or the GPU or whatever is the, the, the thing that you're operating on. So through that particular process, the, the I.O. interface, the data goes into the memory, right? So in traditional world, what happens is that when data goes into the memory, the part where the data is pushed to the memory is where decryption of the data happens. So the data is in the memory in the clear. So with confidential computing, what we do is that the data kind of like is still encrypted as you push it into, like what you said, a region in the memory. And sometimes we use the word uh, enclave to specify that as the region. And the data is sitting in that region in memory 
in the form of an enclave, and all access to that particular piece of memory is completely cut off through hardware level access controls. So a classic example, if you look at what happens in any type of like attack on your memory, uh, people get access to um, the, the memory walk. It's mm -hmm. called privilege escalation. So you are escalating yourself to be an administrator. You get access to that particular piece of memory, and then you just walk the contents of the memory, saying, hey, what's the next address? What's the next address? What's the next address? And give it, right? Obviously, it's not that easy. You need to kind of like tap into certain vulnerabilities in order to do that. So what happens with enclaves is that even if you walk the enclave, uh, first of all, because you don't have access through the walks, you don't get access to the enclave. And second, even if you do get access to the enclave, you may lose encrypted data. And the fact that the data is encrypted, nobody has access to that particular piece of data. Now, let's talk about how um, some of the technologies drive this, right? Uh, and you asked about attestation. So the way it works is that the hardware has this particular restricted area in memory, and data is always in encrypted there. Now, when you have an application software, let's go for the simple example of the bank, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have the uh, bank server, which kind of like is, um, is the endpoint of your web transaction. Uh, what happens in that particular scenario is that the bank server application, which is running in that particular piece of memory, needs to go and authorize itself in two ways. The first one is needs to go and say, is this really in an encrypted stage? Because that's how you put the data into that particular piece of memory. The second is to say, am I authorized in order to access this, this piece of data? If the answer is yes, then you are given a token to say you can access it. And that take token is what you present to the, the key engine so the key engine gives you the right keys, and then you decrypt that data inside of this particular enclave. Remember, everybody else is still isolated from it. Any privilege walk and things like that, the hardware doesn't allow you access. So that's exactly how applications get access to it. So from an Intel perspective, we have two technologies. One is called the software guard extensions, where you explicitly go in and state, what is that piece of uh, uh, hardware or memory? And the other one is called trust domain extensions, where your provider will give you access and say, hey, this is a confidential virtual machine. And all that you do is to kind of like use your data, use what is called the, uh, uh, the, the attestation. And we have a product called Intel Trust Authority, which does the attestation in order to do this. In a very simple way, I'll tell you, when all of us walk into hotels, I'm assuming all of us are staying in hotels and hotel rooms here, right? You walk in, and there is a safe. You say, okay, I'm gonna put all my valuables in the safe so that even when cleaners and whoever, maintenance people, walk into my hotel room, they don't have access to my, uh, my, my uh, data or whatever it is because I put it uh, on in the safe, so mm -hmm. they don't have access to it. So that is as simple as SGX as a technology. You use the safe explicitly. The other is TDX as a technology where the hotel says, look, we have made sure that your entire room is completely under your access. You can use Intel Trust Authority to verify that this entire room is protected. So now you can put your wallets, you can put your um, uh, valuable equipment inside of the room, but nobody has access. That's the way this technology works. Yeah, that's a really interesting analogy. And it, it, it sort of brings up a point that I wanted to ask about, which is that you know, when you have any of this kind of you know, trusted computing, confidential computing setup, to some extent, anyone who's relying on it then has to trust whoever sort of created it. And, um, and, and you know, so with like the hotel safe example, right, you know if the hotel really needed to, they can break into the safe. There are limits to the security there. And there have been questions raised at times about you know, how secure some of these technologies are. And there have been reports like SGX, for example. There were reports of some vulnerabilities in it. You know, so you know, is it just a case of like making the, the barrier and, and the, the, uh, the ability to attack it much, much greater? Or, you know, is there a level of, of trust for, for people who are using these technologies that they know that you know, the data that goes in there is really safe and protected? That's an excellent question, too. 
Um, obviously, we're all engineers to an extent, and uh, anytime that we create products, whether it's hardware or software, uh, we, we call and say they have bugs in it. Uh, bugs are ways in which people can tap into any type of like vulnerabilities which exist. So a lot of times what happens is that um, uh, most corporations, uh, whether it's Intel or Microsoft or Google or any of these corporations, anytime that there are vulnerabilities um, that they detect, they send you security updates. Most of us with our phones, you say, hey, here is a security update, here is a security patch that you get, right? You want to be diligent with it. You want to kind of like apply these security patches so that you have the latest and greatest. A lot of times what happens is that vulnerabilities exist, they're detected, and then the systems are even uh, informed that you need to make the change. But you know that's not our prime job a lot of times, and we don't tend not to do that. And that's where it becomes uh, uh, more susceptible, and you, you hear and see of these vulnerabilities. And this is not to say that uh, uh, you know, corporations detect all the vulnerabilities themselves. The co sometimes it's even the external researchers and things like that who detect these vulnerabilities. But it's our responsibility to address it and fix it ASAP. And when you do that, you got to apply. And this is where things like Intel Trust Authority also make sense, where you go in and say, hey, do I have the latest patch? Do I have the latest version? Can I go and define my policy to make sure that you don't even authenticate and say I can release my keys till I know for sure that all the patches that have been available have been applied on that particular piece of infrastructure? That's why in combination, these are, are good. But to answer your broader question, yes, it makes it more and more and more difficult in order to tap in, um, and, and that's what these technologies provide you. So let, let's move on from the, the general framing of confidential computing over to specifically confidential AI, which I know you wanted to talk about. What, what is that? You know, obviously there's been a lot of talk today about AI and it's just sort of generally out there. Everybody's thinking about it and what does it mean? Um, so what is confidential AI as compared to the confidential computing? Yeah, this is a emerging field, confidential AI. Um, and. Uh, uh, my definition of confidential AI may or may not be the same definition that others use. At the core of it, when you have your, uh, your data and you need to train models, right? Most of the times the models may be public, not the weights of the models, but the models may be public. How do you know that the uh, data that you're shipping to a certain location in order to train these models is safe and secure, first thing, right? And how do you know that the models and the weight of the models that have been created are based exactly on the piece of data that, that you shipped and nothing else kind of like got in the way, right? And this is where confidential AI as a field uh, is, is prominent right now. It's an extension of confidential computing. That's why some of the things we spoke about make sense. So in confidential AI, what happens is that you go through the exact same process, right? As the data is loaded from either the network or the storage devices onto memory, the data is all encrypted. But you, as the owner of either the data or the models, go in and say, do I trust the environment where inferencing is happening or training is happening with that particular piece of data? Do I know the underlying software which is doing the training and inferencing? Do I trust that particular piece of software, right? You can go and verify through some of the things that we spoke about with respect to Intel Trust Authority. You can create your policies in order to verify. And only when you verify that this is what is happening and you know the complete chain of everything that exists inside of the environment where training or inference is happening, do you allow for the keys to be shipped so that decryption of that particular piece of data happens? So what's the result of all of this? The result of all of this is that you control the data, you control the models, you control the release of the keys, you are even controlling the environment where the uh, training and inferencing is happening. So when you know that this is what is available, and even let's say you're trying to train or infer in a public cloud kind of like environment, which is very, very good, very important, because a lot of times you may say, hey, I'm gonna train for eight hours and I'm gonna use that data for, uh, you know, couple of months, and the next time I need to train, I'm gonna redo that, right? So 
when you leverage public cloud or any type of like cloud infrastructure for that uh, purpose, you know that you have a fully controlled environment. Right. The same thing when it comes to inferencing, you may say, look, I want to infer on uh, edge devices. And when you want to go infer on edge devices, how do you know that those devices are fully safe and secure and your data is not compromised, right? That's what this technology allows you to do. Um, so why is it confidential AI? Uh, you know, it, it not only works in terms of the mainstream CPU as a technology, mm -hmm. but it can extend to domain-specific computing as well, uh, whether it is GPUs or other things. Some of these things are kind of like in the kitchen, um, still kind of like being developed, but uh, you will see some of these technologies be available quite soon in the industry, and that's why this is very promising. So, so let's make it a little more concrete for everybody and sort of real that they can think about specific examples. I mean, you know, earlier today there was a lot of discussion of healthcare and things like that, and, and to me at least that's an area where it's obvious that like, you know, AI has a tremendous amount of potential, but also a tremendous amount of risk, right? You know, people are concerned about their private data and how it's being handled, and you know, you can see these concerns where it's like, you, you could see this, the potential of, okay, you know, here's an AI model. If I could feed it a whole bunch of my personal data and it could you know, notice things or discover things and let me know about it or you know, warn me in advance so that I can realize things like what was discussed this morning, but there's a lot of risk there where it's like that, that's your private data and you have to be really concerned about it. Is confidential AI the kind of thing that can, can help with kind of the healthcare AI questions? Absolutely. Uh, let's take it to the, uh, the, the finest extreme, right? Um, and the finest extreme is that um, uh, you, uh, Mike, you have some of your own personal sensitive data, right? Let's say you're storing some of those things on um, uh, your own machine, and mm -hmm. you know for sure that that machine is something which you're patched and it's, it's the latest and greatest. Uh, but then you want to send that data to an application running somewhere in the cloud and say, hey, this is my personal data. Tell me something about me. You obviously wouldn't go train models and things like that, right? So in, in the finest extreme, you can use confidential computing to say, do I trust the infrastructure where my application um, uh, or, or where my data is going to run on an application so that it can give me certain sensitive results. So you have your data encrypted. Um, the, the machine doesn't know anything about it. Obviously, it knows that it's doing certain set of applications. You can go through and r make sure that that particular machine is indeed running things in a confidential computing environment. That machine also is trustworthy. It's all been maintained in terms of latest and greatest. And then you ship your data in order to do this. And for us, luckily, um, uh, a lot of times when I collaborate with uh, our partners like the uh, Microsofts and Googles, they're kind of like both uh, a, a vendor for, uh, sorry, a customer for our technology, uh, but also we're a vendor in terms of uh, some, some other means as well. And what I mean by that is that um, they deploy our technology in order to offer uh, confidential computing to their end customers. But at the same time, when our machines are deployed, let's say in a Kroger store or any of these retail store, um, they have a lot of IP. They want to move their data and models to the local retail store and say, I'm going to provide you a certain set of services. So how do they know that that, that end device where they're sending is, uh, is not going to steal the IP and data, right? That's why they can kind of tend to be both partners and to an extent customers uh, of this technology to, as well. Um, are, are there other examples too? I mean, you know, I, I think there are a lot of cases where obviously like right now there's, there are questions around how do you protect data? There are all sorts of general privacy questions out there at the same time with all this excitement about AI and all the different ways that it can be used. Are there other things that are maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, reaching further out there, a little more pie in the sky about like, what, what is, wh where's the excitement? I mean, this is, this is exciting to, to some extent, but like, you know, let's, let's go forward a few years and think a little bit more futuristically. You know, where do you see, you know, where do you see something really cool coming out of this? So there, there are a lot of examples that I can give you. And uh, one of the other examples that uh, will be exciting in this particular area is multi-party compute, right? Um, Think of scenarios where you're a hospital setting, 
and uh, you're trying to detect uh, things like brain tumor. And you want to use AI in order to detect brain tumor in this particular scenario. You know, brain tumor is, first of all, not that common. Um, and if you want to train machines in order to detect certain things of this particular nature, you need a tremendous amount of data. And you know, one brain tumor may be different from another, so uh, it may be harder for you to detect it, right? So uh, we, we see like multiple hospitals kind of like getting together and then using confidential compute in order to do multi-party compute, federated compute, in order to say, how do I ensure that I can give my data for training, I can extract models, which is a result of not just my data, but data from like multiple hospitals, and at the end of the day, once you do this combination, not only are you making sure that your data is still HIPAA compliant, nobody has access to it, and you're taking care of your data the way uh, compliance and regulations want you to take care of your data, but at the same time, you built models where these models are rich. Now, you can bring those models back and then use those models in order to do uh, analysis of brain tumors and things like that in, in, in different uh, uh, patients over a period of time. So we did uh, a, a kind of like um, a, a proof of concept in this particular regard uh, with the University of California, San Francisco, and uh, I believe they assembled something of the order of 50 or 60 different hospitals where you got data from a lot of these hospitals in order to do something of this particular nature. So the methodology of kind of like uh, making sure that you're fully in control of the data and the methodology where you kind of like go and infer based on this particular data is, is very useful. I'll stretch it even further. I personally believe that, uh, uh, again, uh, I, I, I don't have the crystal ball to say when, but I personally believe that all computing in the future will become confidential computing. Think of uh, your self-driving car, right? Uh, you literally are relying your life on that particular car. You're relying on algorithms that are used in order to train or run that particular car. And all of us know that anytime you have computational infrastructure, anytime you have connected computational infrastructure, there is always a risk of that infrastructure getting hacked or compromised. So you add another layer of defense, and now you say, not only is my car running on um, on uh, AI data, but I know where the data came from, I know how the training happened, and even the inference happening in my car as I drive every minute is making sure that no other applications, nothing else has visibility to this model and this data. It's all happening in an encrypted and in a confidential manner, right? So. I, I do believe that uh, fast forward uh, X number of years, I hope it's sooner rather than later, um, all compute will be confidential. It, it, it's interesting to me because right there's all these conversations now, and this might also be a little further afield in a different direction, but it occurred to me as you were speaking, there are all these discussions about like data privacy laws and data protection and you know like you know, big tech is, I guess you're a part of big tech, but in a different way, like, you know, that they're I'm like- I'm big, there are mega techs now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, that they're like sucking up all this data and we need laws to, to protect. And, and it, it's occurring to me, like, I'm wondering if this kind of technology actually solves at least a portion of, the, of that question, where if you can control your own data, but yet still get the advantages of like, you know, if you're giving it to, to you know, location data or, or other information about like, you know, whatever people, whatever data social media picks up on you or whatever, you know, could it be a, a situation where the users actually really end up in control, they still get the benefits of the sort of, you know, cloud computing aspect without having to give up their privacy in the process? Absolutely. Um, you know, um, a, a very good friend of mine, his name is Mark Rusinovich, he's the uh, CTO of Azure at Microsoft. He always says that what confidential computing does is it creates a private cloud in public, edge, or any cloud setting. And, uh, and talking about regulations, and specifically regulations in, uh, in AI, it's just like AI is moving fast. These regulators are moving reasonably fast as well. Um, the European Un Union just passed a EU AI Act mm -hmm. where they want to make sure that any data which is used either for training or inferencing 
you can explain exactly where the data came from. You remove any insider threats. You also kind of like ensure that uh, you've taken all sorts of precautions in order to make sure that you've built a zero trust strategy and approach when it comes to training and inferencing. Um, the US is doing something similar in the Biden White House where about 10 or maybe 12 companies got together and it's not yet a, a law, but they did a pledge in right. order to uh, ensure and eliminate any cybersecurity risks when it comes to um, uh, AI training and inference. And uh, look, uh, th this, this technology enables you to create like a very high bar in that it removes insiders, even um, hypervisor admins or your own uh, enterprise admins from having visibility to the data in the clear. So uh, I, I do believe that uh, these compliance and regulations are coming. Uh, a lot of times compliance and regulations wait for technology to be available, to be kind of like proven in the industry before they become um, uh, regulations. So uh, it's going to happen. Um, we are working on it. Uh, our partners in uh, Microsoft, Google, most of the uh, cloud service providers are all working in this particular regard because it's in our best interest in order to make sure that not only can you bring your data to, to train in private or, or edge cloud, but you also have the confidence and you know that your data is fully in your control till you authorize and, uh, and release the keys. So those are things that are very much in progress. Cool. Um, we, we have a little less than four minutes left, so I want to see if anyone had any questions. The, the microphones on, on the side, I see somebody jumping right up and walking to the microphone, so we do have a question. Go for it. Well, I promised you at lunch I would ask you a question here, and lo and behold, here it is. Uh, and, and I have to say, I think you're, so I'm Marco Castellana, I am VP Products of Azure AI at Microsoft, and so you know, we know we... We're partners. We, we have a natural uh, inclination to talk to each other, but. And, and to some degree, you know, I, I had a hard time understanding the value of confidential compute in the public cloud, although, you know, you, you kind of talk to that. Although, you know, with the edge compute, it makes more sense, right, when you're talking about distributing data confidentially. So my question is, what's the catch? That is to say, I mean, if you're going to do this on edge devices, uh, is it going to consume a whole bunch more battery? If you're going to do it in your self-driving cars, is that going to consume your mileage? Like, what, what is the catch to this confidential compute? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, I I'll tell you that one of the big reasons why this technology is so impressive is that it's probably not too much of a catch. Um, if you compare this technology to something else, which is called homomorphic encryption, where data is encrypted and uh, you continue to uh, keep the data encrypted when you operate on that particular piece of data, homomorphic encryption puts something of the order of like, you know, 100, 1,000, 10,000 X in terms of performance impact um, uh, in, in, as compared to non-homomorphically encrypted data. But confidential computing, not much. Three, five percent, right? So imagine that when you go from one generation of the technology to another generation of technology, um, uh, we, we generally tend to provide 15 to 20 percent improvement in performance instead of getting 20% improvement in performance, you may get 14, 15, 16. So that's really what uh, uh, the, the technology is. Obviously, the entire process of me saying that you gotta verify that um, the, the, the infrastructure is safe and secure uh, before you release the keys, those are things that uh, needs to happen, but uh, uh, in the modern day where we kind of like write millions of lines of codes in, in, in minutes, you know, incorporating one uh, step in the process where you go and act us through something like Intel Trust Authority, it's just a small bump in the road, and that's the thing that you need to do. The thing that we tend to uh, promise, and actually the promise is in collaboration with uh, you folks at Azure, um, is that if you have an application, in order for you to run the same application in a confidential environment, you should be able to do it in less than uh, a week and you should be able to do it with uh, almost zero hit to performance. That's really where we want to get to. We have Thank you. Very quick question. We have about 45 seconds, so quick sure. question. And quick uh, you answer. mentioned working with the UCSF. Is that a federated learning model that uh, you're, you're deploying there? Yeah, it was a proof of concept, and uh, you can go to intel.com slash security, and you can uh, look for um, um, the, the exact case study there. Um, yes, it is. Uh, 
a case of federated. Uh, sometimes we use multi-party. Sometimes we also use the word privacy-preserving AI. So uh, different marketing people in my own company use different terminology for that. But you should see those uh, pieces of data there. Great. And with that, I, uh, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Great Thank you, everybody. Thank you.